Hello and welcome. My name is Roni Firon, and this is The Bigger Picture, where we sit down with experts to hear about their journeys, their insights, and the big ideas that drive them. Stay tuned for today's episode. In today's conversation, I spoke with Micha Kaufman, founder and CEO of Fiverr. Fiverr has completely revolutionized the gig economy, making freelance work accessible for people all over the world. Fiverr simplifies the process of connecting freelancers with their customers, which allows freelancers to truly make a living from their work and provides easy access for businesses large and small to highly skilled individuals. We spoke about where the idea for Fiverr came from, how the company looked in its early days, and what it took to make the Fiverr dream a reality. Micha shared his insights about what it takes to build a strong company culture and what values are important to cultivate in order to keep an ever-expanding company integrated and focused on the grander vision. Fiverr has opened so many doors for so many people around the world. And one of the things that were clear from our conversation was that at Fiverr, they never lose sight of the people they are serving. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy today's conversation with Micha Kaufman. Micha Kaufman, welcome to the Bigger Picture podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I want to start at the beginning. One of the things that interests me and I'm sure will interest our listeners is what qualities make for a good entrepreneur? Looking back at your childhood and maybe also your teenage years and your 20s, what clues were already there that pointed you taking the entrepreneurial route? I'm not sure if I know what what the right attributes are for being a successful entrepreneur. I may have some clues into uh, a few of them. I think one of the most notable ones is curiosity, just in general, and the ability to dive in and learn new fields of interest. Why do you think those are so important? I think from my own experience, this is how I've paved my way. Looking back into a lot of the more successful entrepreneurs and, and actually most successful people, they don't need to be entrepreneurs. Right. You know, curiosity is one of the traits that we love in people at Fiverr, as an example. And, and one of the things when I welcome new team members into the company. One of the things that I that I always say is be curious to the point of digging into things that have nothing to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get into the reports that you have no access to. Listen into conversations that you're not a part of. Jump into meetings that have nothing to do with you. This is how advancement is made by just you know, people following their curiosity and learning new things and and asking questions. People talk about first principle thinking. Right, you know, right. This is all about, you know, asking the questions, trying to understand why things work the way they do. So from my experience, this has been probably the lowest common denominator of all successful entrepreneurs. Right. There's a certain intrinsic motivation and an intrinsic reward for just learning new things, whatever the field is. Plus, it inspires you. I mean, one of the things that I do pretty frequent to have my CPU up and running all the time is just to read things. It doesn't need to be technical things or business related things. It could be fantasy or fiction. But when you deal with things, when you let yourself be carried by storytelling, it creates something interesting in your in, in the way we're wired as human beings. And I think that this creates amazing inspiration. So I, I think that this is just the ability to to follow threads and allow yourself to sometimes go into these rabbit holes are things that really inspires you to think in a, in a nonlinear way. Right. It gets the creative juices flowing. And I think it also opens you up, as you said, for inspiration. There's a certain element to being interested in all sorts of different fields and also even, you know, the art of storytelling. 
and how different stories give you different perspectives and different contexts. And all of that can help you really see the big picture, right? And to imagine something that still doesn't exist and bring it into the world. So on that, when Fiverr first started, where did the idea even come from? What did the creative process look like of coming up with this idea? I'm not sure if there is a perfect answer for this. Fiverr is my fourth company, so I've done it a few times. And in each time was slightly different. The period of time leading to Fiverr was a time when I was winding down one of my previous businesses. I was actually in the process of selling it, which didn't happen at the end. And I was starting to think about what would be the next thing. And I knew where my fields of passion were. In my previous companies, I've done a pretty wide range of different companies from a security startup to a medical device startup to a consumer internet company. So I knew where I was gravitating towards, but I wasn't sure as to what the next thing would be. And I, one of the things that I've done is I've created what seems to be a little bit less known or popular in Israel, which is a think tank. So the idea was to create a think tank, invite some of my best friends, all of them entrepreneurs, and spend some time pretty unstructured to think about what's going to be the future of software and internet. I think this was late 2007, going into 2008, just before the recession, which we didn't have any clue was coming. The idea was... We met once every, I think, two weeks, got a little drunk, (laughs) and just spoke about interesting things that we were reading, thinking, entrepreneurs we were meeting with. And that was a process to inspire ourselves to think about, try to start formalizing things that we had in our thoughts and thought processes. And in that activity also inspired a lot of conversations that I had one-on-one with other people, some of them my friends, some of them I just knew from the industry. And in one of these conversations with a good friend of mine at the time led to what Fiverr came to be. We used to have tens of these conversations every week that started from, I have an idea. What was for me interesting in that process is the way I've defined a system to look for new ideas. And I think that that really helped. So for me, the principle for finding a new idea at the time, which I think applies to today as well, was to say I was looking for a well-established market, meaning I'm not going to create a market. I'm not going to go through the hoops of educating people to understand that they need something they didn't know they need. So instead of that, looking for an established market that is large and preferably global, that has a lot of intrinsic inefficiency and friction that you can potentially address with smart software, which sounds super simplistic. But actually, when you think about this, this is kind of the definition of what Amazon or Alibaba did for e-commerce, right? They they took an existing market, a lot of inefficiency and friction, and using software, they've created what they are today. In a sense, this is what Airbnb did for hospitality or Uber for transportation. So essentially, when you think about Fiverr, you think about the freelancing economy, it's been around for centuries. It's huge. It's just becoming bigger. But it's still, you know, largely operates as a very old-fashioned market. I mean, you need a freelancer, what do you do? You reach out to your friends and ask, you know, ask them for advice. This is broken, right? And then everything that has to do with it is broken. Like, nothing is standardized. Nothing comes easy for anyone, for the freelancer or the customer. And this, to me, looked like an amazing opportunity. I think a lot of entrepreneurs are deterred by existing markets saying, like, How can you reinvent transportation? How can you reinvent banking or insurance or whatever? It's all done. No, it's far from being done, right? Right. I think what we are seeing is that optimization is something people are really looking for. When you can make something 
easier and more efficient than the market response. Yeah, and software obviously plays a massive role in increasing efficiency. But sometimes when you take inefficient processes and you productize them, there's so much more to gain than just automating things. I mean, Fiverr hasn't automated most of the freelancing activity, but it has significantly, dramatically improved even the lifestyle of being a freelancer or a customer. It has just made things so much better that is far from the actual software solution that powers this machine. Right, there's a whole ripple effect. And there's a cultural change. In a sense, what we're doing with Fiverr is a movement. When we started Fiverr, as an idea that was towards the end of 2009, we went live at the beginning of 2010. And at that time, when you thought about freelancing, or this was mostly what people did in between jobs. Right. right? But it's not being a freelancer is a career. Right. It can actually sustain somebody. It's a career and it's a lifestyle. Because it's not just what do you do for work. It's how do you live your life. It's a cultural change. I want to get into that whole cultural impact, which is massive and I think has happened in all sorts of different directions. But before we get into that, I'd love to hear a little bit about what did the first days of Fiverr look like? You know, What were some of the first steps of making this dream a reality? And what were some of the signs in those early days that gave you a sense that you were going in the right direction? So the early days of Fiverr came before, obviously, Fiverr went live. We were in the process of, I think we spent eight or nine months building Fiverr, and we coded it ourselves. We weren't funded. We decided to go bootstrap. And why? Why did you decide Well, that? so for once, we could afford it. Not afford a, a large team, but we were the two co-founders. We had enough knowledge in product and development. And with the help of one freelancer that we took to do some of the backend database management, we've hugged the entire thing ourselves. But beyond that, I think I've seen my previous businesses and in other businesses that I was consulting to or working with, at the time at least, let's remember this is 11 years ago. Right. There was this whole cult of hyping your business, you know, <laughs> trying to build yep. it through TechCrunch or just pouring unbelievable amounts of money into trying to buy your own business. And my experience taught me that, or at least for me, this was not the right path. And I've decided that this should be something that could grow grassroots. Like really have the stickiness and the viral coefficiency to feed itself. And so the early days were devoted to cracking that, trying to understand what could be the ingredients that have to be in place for this to happen from day one. And this was just engineering that. That was really important. This was the first time that I was involved in a market base. And market bases are amazing creatures. Probably in retrospect, I can say that there's nothing that comes close to it in interest. I'm always saying we're sitting now in a studio as we record this podcast and running a marketplace is like sitting in a studio. You have these amazing mixers with a thousand knobs that you can change. Some of them you can play with and they do nothing. And some of them you touch and they change everything. It takes years to perfect that. It was super interesting. And it was about asking yourself some basic questions. What do you do first? Do you deal with supply or demand first? I mean, super basic stuff that we had absolutely no answer to. So figuring out that and, and also trying to understand and craft the way we started with the model. So for people that don't remember, Fiverr started as a $5 right. market base which was our starting point. It was borderline gimmick, but it allowed us to gain scale very rapidly. 
because it was, I mean, the pricing wasn't the barrier. Um, right. And why $5? What was the thinking around that? So from a strategic standpoint, what we decided was that the way we're going to build this market base would be to start at the very bottom of the market, meaning starting with micro services for micro businesses and over time go up market. And again, doing my, my own research on business strategy, I've noticed that there are very few cases in business history of companies that were able to successfully go down market mm -hmm. without cannibalizing their upper market segment. Right. Like what? What did you find? Well, so I think in a sense, I mean, if you look at Uber as an example, which is an extremely successful company, they started at the very top of the market with black cars and limos. But essentially, they had to go down market to get to the mass market. As they done this descent, it was at the expense of the black car business. I mean, that portion of the business is not what's booming, right? So this is a great example of how difficult that is. It's not about being smart or stupid. It's just super, super hard to go down market without cannibalizing your premium segment. And so our decision was we're going to start at the bottom of the market. By doing so, we also dealt with the complexity of pricing and price elasticity in general. As we were thinking about microservices, we said, you know what? There needs to be one well-defined price that is going to be the price that we start with. And freelancers are just talented enough to understand how to slice their offerings to meet those prices. The decision to go with $5 was... I was looking for a price that didn't make people think twice. Right. That it was easy to just click. So like I felt at least at the time that $9 was kind of stretching it. Like if it's nine bucks, I will think twice, maybe not 50 times, but twice. I really wanted to get. So you think about this and I, I always give this analogy. It's like a Frappuccino at Starbucks, right? right? The benefit of having that also is the fact that when you buy a cup of coffee, if it's not the most amazing cup of coffee you've ever drank, you're not devastated. <laughs> it's not like your day is ruined, right? Right, you can go get another cup of coffee. Exactly. <laughs> so, so this was kind of the thinking of like, because we didn't even have the infrastructure to actually start to vet every service and every service provider that was coming in. So we wanted to keep it at a size where where it's going to be manageable. And this was just the beginning and it took off super quickly. And then over the years, we've added, obviously went up market and added what is now services between the tens of dollars to the tens of thousands of dollars that are being offered. At what point did you guys realize that you can let go of that $5 price and give people flexibility? Giving flexibility was the original idea anyway. The confidence that this was possible, I would say pretty quickly, a matter of a, maybe a couple of months. Okay. But once we had the mechanics of the market base kick in and it started having, you know, a life of its own. It sounds like a very organic thing. Oh, it, was. <laughs> it was. Completely. That was the beauty of it. I mean, forcing yourself to create something that would organically feed itself, have a massive flywheel effect built into it, is so powerful that we're now a public company over 11 years in business and the majority of our business is organic. And this is not to say that we're not doing the Super Bowl. Right. But this is the minority of our business. If you get this flywheel effect, right? If you get the viral coefficient to be high and sustain itself, if you take the time to perfect the user experience, not just for your first user, but for your 10 millionth customer, then it's so powerful that it continue feeding itself even a decade after you started. Right. It sounds like there's this whole process where you're creating something that has a life of its own. And as you're moving along, you're learning from 
what it's teaching you, really, from the inputs you're getting from this marketplace and from how people are choosing to interact there. So I wanted to zoom out a bit and to talk about this general idea of how do you balance your original vision and your own ideas and opinions and intuitions about what the right course is with the input that you're getting from the outside, whether it's the market, the users, your coworkers, or investors? And how do you dance that fine dance and, and learn to fine tune things along the way? Some of it is art and some of it is science, obviously. So having started a few companies, there's one thing that I've realized, which is as entrepreneurs, as startups, we build products with some idea in mind. We have our own idea of how customers are going to use it. <laughs> but at the end, they come and they use it the way they want to use it. And sometimes it's, it's very similar to what you thought, and sometimes it's super different. And so it is very important to understand how things that you create are actually being used. And some of that is, obviously, people are obsessed with data analysis, which I think is important. But the thing about data is that it doesn't tell you what's not in the data. Mm-hmm. Um, what you're not measuring is right. just not there. Exactly. Which is, if people are frustrated, they're trying to do something and they can't, this, the data will not show you. You might get hints to it in the data. Like you understand that people are bouncing at a certain point in the journey or the funnel, but it is not going to actually give you a sense of you know what's broken, what's going on. So data is important. Customer care is super important. I've spent the first few months when we launched the company, I've done customer care tickets myself. This was the majority of my time. Wow. Um, Yeah. And what Um, were you learning from there? First, I would say that it's an amazing medium of conversation because there's very few that you can actually have a discussion with a customer, right? You can either read their posts on social, whatever, which in many cases, you're going to get the extremes. Of, right, people um, who are yeah, really angry. <laughs> your, your fans or, or your yeah. haters. There you go. But it's also like trying to get into a conversation over social media is like getting into a street fight, <laughs> right? So It's very reactive. I, I wouldn't do that <laughs> anyway. So trying to find a channel through which you can have genuine conversations that... Sometimes people expect you to just solve their problem, but if you ask them a question, they would spend a day giving you their perspective on what you're doing. So this was really, really important. And then it's about, at least for me, it was about creating the principles upon which Fiverr operates as a company and defining our values. Not just what we are and what we do, but not less importantly, the things that we're never going to do. Because what what happens is, and and this is certainly when you start to succeed, what happens is that there's a lot of smart people. Some of them are your customers. Some of them are potential investors. Some of them are whatever, potential partners or companies that you get a lot of opportunities. And it's, I think, equally important to know which to say no to. Just say, this is something we're never going to do. That's not in line with our values. Exactly. So I think that having those principles allowed us to also understand and, and refine how we were building the product and also listening to customers and, and using things like first principles to actually understand. It's like the famous Ford story, right? Mm. <laughs> you ask people, what do they want? They want, to have their carriage with more horses so they can move faster. It's not actually what they're asking. They're asking to get from point A to point B faster. Right. That, that's, so sometimes customers ask you for things. And if you don't get to the why. Read between the lines. If you don't get to the why, if you don't understand what what is actually motivating them to ask this, then you can either solve it the way they ask you to and then you're a very similar to an enterprise software where you do everything the customers tell you to do. Or you stay true to the way you do things, but you actually solve for fundamental challenges, which I think is how we've done it. 
What were some of those starting out values that you defined? It started from this framework of using software to remove friction and improve efficiency. And one of the important things that we've done, so one of the principles or or values was we need to address complex problems with super simple, easy to use, something that that a five-year-old can understand, beautiful, intuitive software. Again, you talk about simplicity. Simplicity is probably the hardest thing to achieve, right? And so this was one. The other was about putting our community first. It sounds fluff, but the reality was that, as I was saying before, we were there with the sense that we're building a movement. We're building a true community. Again, 11 years ago, there wasn't a place for freelancers to actually gather or exchange ideas or knowledge with others. Because unlike the office where you you come to the office and then you you socialize, which is one benefit, and then you you know you have knowledge transfer, which is really important for your career progress. Freelancers spend their time in their underwear in front of the TV <laughs> with their laptop, right? Or go to a coffee shop, which has amazing benefits, obviously. But then the disadvantages are that sometimes you're lonely. You're just alone. And when we created Fiverr, it was really important for me that when people join Fiverr, and it doesn't matter if they want to offer their talent or they want to have access to talent, that they would not become another username. Right. You know? They would become a community member. And that meant putting them together in touch with like-minded people that are going through similar career paths or building their lifestyles. And that created amazing things. But beyond that, we had this unique opportunity to create a plain level platform that really removed most of the biases that we have in everyday life. So status hierarchies and all sorts of things like that. But it's more basic than that. We've done an analysis on on the Fiverr community, on the talent side. And we said, let's try to analyze things that are happening within our community. And one amazing thing that we found was that the women are actually making about 10% more than men on Fiverr. I mean, I'm not super surprised, but what I am surprised is, or feel fortunate about, is the fact that when you create a platform where your age, gender, you know, the color of your skin, your religion doesn't really play any role. You're, right. you're being judged on your performance as a professional, right? And nobody cares if you're male or female. Right. It's an even playing field. That's amazing because that, that makes the world flatter. So this was really important for us. So when you think about how these values trickle down into our daily lives, if you come to our office, it's mostly open space. And the reason for the open space is because we're trying to push what we call radical transparency, which is which is this around this curiosity idea. Like everybody should understand how this entire machine works. Nobody is a, is a cog, right? There's no black boxes, input and output. Like to do your job and to be impactful, you should actually understand how this machine works. So we've we've laid out the office as open as possible so we're all accessible. I, I don't sit in a room. But beyond that, it gave us an opportunity to actually involve our community members in how we design the office. And the idea is that no matter where you sit at the office, you have a line of sight to things that are hanged on the wall or on the tables or on the chairs that was actually created, crafted by one of our community members. And this is to remind you who you work for. Wow. Because these the, constant these, mementos. Exactly. This is your true constituents. It's not shareholders. Like Shareholders, they're benefiting from the fact that you're building an amazing community. But you put your community first. So these are just a few examples. Now I'd love to talk about this tremendous impact that Fiverr has had, as we said before, culturally. Right, We've completely seen a change in how people conceptualize work in the gig economy, freelancers. And 
I think also opening up opportunities, as we said, doesn't matter what your sex, what your age is, and also what country of origin you're from. You know, you can work from any place in the world. So starting out, what kind of impact were you most hoping that Fiverr will have? And today, what kinds of impacts and revolutions have you seen that you weren't even expecting? So again, it's more than a decade. So I think what's happening right now was in a way in our imagination. I think the pace is probably faster. You talk about timing when you start companies. The timing for Fiverr couldn't be better because we launched 2010 and that coincided with the time when millennials were getting into into the workplace, which was perfect because this is, it's a generation that rethinks the concept of work. Yeah, they threw the rule books out completely. Completely. And by the way, amazing things and some things are not so amazing, right? (laughs) But I think in, in general, more people saw this as a career path, but also as a way of living. And you've mentioned digital nomads, people that are just packing their laptops and, and a few shirts and go roam the world and just work from anywhere, which we definitely wanted to enable. We've done a series of stories about digital nomads and we've had a few that work with us and have written some amazing blogs on it. We really wanted to allow people that had a skill, a true skill, to have access to the people that need that skill. And we we understood that that talent is global and so is the demand for it. And 20 years ago, they thought about this. The traditional thinking was that this was all about outsourcing, right? So if an American company needs cheaper R&D, they should go to India and have a large center to do it there. But the reality is that the world doesn't work like that anymore because there's unbelievable talent all around the world. And on Fiverr, actually the majority of transactions are cross-border. But you see a lot of transactions that are counterintuitive to the old way of thinking. It's an Indian company that is working with an American freelancer Interesting. Right to build their business. Economies in general have developed incredibly in the past decade. China is an obvious... But India, India is exploding. And we started to see that there were amazing pockets of talent all around the world. What was really important for us was that we created a system that actually understand people's motivation, right? So some people have a a little bit of a free time every day, I don't know, maybe two hours or three hours. And they would love to do something with that time. Maybe develop a new skill, maybe test a new skill, maybe get into a new area, or maybe just make an additional income to what they're doing in their nine to five or whatever. But there are people that want to make this a full-time thing. There are people that want to make it a full-time thing, but also grow it into an agency, make it something bigger. There are existing agencies that want access to customers from all around the world. And Fiverr really wanted to solve for all of these cases. So thinking about this, you need to have a pretty sophisticated tech to actually understand how to manage liquidity, how to run liquidity, when you have so many different cases within your catalog. And how to do that as you continue pushing all the market upwards to make sure that you can not just include microservices or micro solutions, but also solve for much more complex types of of services. When we even think further than that, the way we think about the community and and how it evolved and how we think about it in the future, Fiverr solves for, when you think about, you know, the Maslow pyramid of needs, right? So at the very bottom is people need access to opportunities. If you can't make money or a living out of your craft or skill, then Nothing else matters. But if we can solve for that, what else can we do? What else can we do to address that well-being or lifestyle of someone who engages with it? And the same, by the way, applies for businesses. Maybe Google doesn't need us to solve for its needs, but, but a smaller business has, you know, is, is very similar to a freelancer in many ways. They're both right. entrepreneurs. They're going in an uncharted path and... 
And so we see our role in this ecosystem much larger than that. We can solve for, you know, think about their professional education. Like how do you gain more skills? How, how do you become better at what you're doing? How can you build a business? If you're thinking about building an agency, what does it take to run an agency? And how can you use the platform to do that? But it also can go down in directions of, okay, great. I'm making money. What do I do with it? How do I think about my, my savings? How do I think about money management in general? Reinvesting it. So as we think into the future, we, we think that the role that we're playing is just going to get larger and larger as the community grows and evolves and becomes, I mean, probably by 2030, studies show that, you know, independent workers are going to be 50% of American. You know, wow. It's mind-boggling. And COVID just made that go even faster. Ac accelerated everything. No, it sounds like this whole marketplace has enabled so many people to become self-starters, you know, and given so many people opportunities to take their skill and to manifest it. And people are able to benefit from their skills and making all of that so much easier and more accessible. Now, kind of to wrap up, I have a broader question about the whole Israeli startup landscape. Why do you think so many successful tech startups emerge from Israel? And what is unique about the culture and the mindset here that enables so much innovation and growth, in your opinion? There's obviously historical reasons for it. You know, Israel is a very young country. Sometimes I half-jokingly say that yeah. we, we still don't have a culture. Really? Yeah. <laughs> It's, you know... Still developing. Work. Yeah. It's in the teenage years, the culture. It is. It is. Certainly if you compare it to Europe or, or even the States. But some of it is out of necessity because we just don't have anything else. Limited natural resources. Yeah, we don't have gold or oil or anything else. Or enough electricity to generate enough crypto. <laughs> um... So it's necessity. Some of it is just the emphasis that I think previous generations have put into education in general, and more specifically in, into engineering. It's definitely the army that is generating, I think, the majority of top tech talent right now. And I think it's also the, the digital revolution, in, in a sense, because it Anything that has to do with physical, Israel is, a, is in a huge disadvantage. It's tiny and it's far from any significant market, maybe with the exception of, of the Arab market, in which we're not in enough good terms to uh, benefit from, which is a shame. But this is the reality. And I think that the internet revolution in general, but everything that came with it, I think made it possible to do things from here. And over the years, we started from being very short-term, short-lived companies that were doing quick startups that ended with quick exits, small exits. But that created the first generation of entrepreneurs here, which then went to build larger companies. And I think that a lot of the local Israeli VC industry were extinct about 10 years ago. Hmm. And was replaced first by the best VCs in the world coming from outside of Israel. And in recent years, with the beginning of like a new breed of Israeli VCs that were very different than the old ones. They were long-term thinkers, raising enough capital to continue backing companies, have enough patience to give companies a decade to be able to grow a business. And I think that that change the landscape. The things that I'm worried about is that many people think about, you know, talk about the startup nation as a concept. And I keep saying that the startup nation is a history book, right? And it tells the story about what happened here, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. But it doesn't mean that it's going to continue being that same notion. And in order to sustain it, and keep the high tech as a driving force for Israel, we need to rethink how we address education and how 
we think about the inclusion of all parts of society in it. Because I think that while you know, high tech is doing amazingly well right now, I think 23 IPOs this year from Israel, which is just unmatched. Mind-blowing. But when you think about this, this creates larger gaps within our society because there's people that are making infinite amount of money and people that have none. And maybe this is nothing you can solve for right now. But if you don't think about how to solve for it in the next, in the coming five or 10 years or 20 years, it's not going to be solved. And these are the things that I'm concerned about more. Even if you think about just the high tech, there's such a clear shortage in talent here. Not because there aren't enough talented people, but there aren't enough people in general. Right, like, right. <laughs> <there's> like, <laughs> If you're thinking this is a message for our for US companies, if you think that you can come to Israel and hire 5,000 engineers, you're wrong. We have none. <laughs> so some companies come here and they have the funding to do it, but there's not enough talent. And I think that this should be changed. We should rethink how we think about technical education, science in general. How do we include more portions of our society into it? Absolutely. I think that's such an important note of also the gaps that are being created and how we as a society, if we want to progress, we want to move everyone along with us, right? You want everyone to benefit from this high-tech boom and from all the possibilities. I think in that sense, high-tech is not, is not a threat, it's an opportunity. I think that if we play right, by we, I mean you know, high-tech itself, and what we can contribute to it, but also the government and the education system, we can actually be in, a, in an amazing situation five, seven years from now. But it takes a lot of attention to do that. And hopefully we're going to have all the team players play as a team. Absolutely. I hope, uh, I hope people listen to that message. I think it's an important one. Micha, thank you so much for this inspiring conversation. You've built a truly revolutionary company. And it was a pleasure to speak with you today and learn all about your Fiverr journey. Thank you, Ronnie. Enjoyed it. For everyone out there listening, thank you for tuning in to The Bigger Picture. I hope you found this conversation interesting. You can find us on all podcasting platforms wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to hit subscribe to stay up to date with the latest episodes. My name is Roni Firon. This is The Bigger Picture. And thank you for listening. Until next time.